It's January 14th, 1938, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Three and a half years in the making, an hour and a half in the showing, and a lifetime in the remembering. So read the poster for Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the reviews for which New York woke up to on this day in 1938. Yeah, the film had actually had its premiere in Hollywood three weeks prior, on December the 21st, 1937, and actually wouldn't yet have its release for another few weeks. It was released in cinemas nationwide on February the 4th, 1938, but this was the kind of perfect window to see this film if you've heard the gossip from california you've heard how good it is head to radio city music hall now new yorkers to see it three (laughs) weeks before the rest of the country and as a result it broke box office records there new yorkers were queuing around the block the queue length was estimated to be about three hours of waiting time just to get a ticket it showed there for five weeks and it could have gone on for longer it was the longest run they'd ever had of any film but they had something booked in afterwards basically it kind of <laughs> kind of fizzled out you know it was going so strong they were like well we've already got a booking for the adventures of huckleberry finn straight after this so you're gonna have to go <laughs> but yeah you read those first reviews and you understand why the nation reacted so positively the new york times review described it as sheer fantasy delightful gay and altogether captivating let your fears be quieted at once mr disney and his amazing technical crew have outdone themselves they just and all of the reviews are like this that they just people just loved it yeah although that one's from the venerable critic frank nugent often quoted because it starts with it is a classic as important cinematically as the birth of a nation (laughs) which is the bit you often hear worth mentioning that the quote does then go on as important cinematically as the birth of a nation or the birth of Mickey Mouse, which is perhaps a little arch. (laughs) I mean, he meant it genuinely. He absolutely loved it. But I still think there was this feeling, even within the Disney company itself, that the achievement, frankly, was getting this off the ground at all. Mm -hmm. The achievement was getting a feature-length animated film into theatres. And I always got the impression that, for Walt personally, the artistic achievement, the feeling of actually making art, probably didn't come until Fantasia, which was his third movie. Mm. Even though actually everyone knows that Fantasia is the really boring one and that Snow White, (laughs) from beginning to end, is a masterpiece. It's beautiful. There's so much that is genuinely artistic going on in this film, from the sort of splashes of water to the billowing of dresses. You know, they really poured their heart and souls into bringing this entire world and all of these characters to life. Yeah, and that level of artistic achievement is all the more remarkable given the fact that a lot of the early Disney animators didn't have an artistic background. Most of them were newspaper cartoonists. Mm. And the original treatment of the film in general was a lot more jolly. Um, the evil queen, for instance, who's actually quite scary, you know, very angular and glamorous evil in the finished product. She was originally a kind of plump, self-important character, kind of like a Marx Brothers dowager <laughs> sort of a figure. And in the end, they made her a little bit more ominous and sinister and that was reflected too in the art which ended up being influenced by things like you know like German expressionism Mm. films like The Cabinet of Dr Caligari especially the terrifying sequence where she's fleeing through the forest which freaked me out so much when I was a kid and apparently did at the time apparently the velvet seats had to be replaced (laughs) at the Radio City (laughs) Music Hall because children kept wetting themselves Oh I can see that you know the the (laughs) twigs turn into these sort of gaunt skeletal fingers That was the moment that my two year old backed out of the room crying oh, really? <laughs> when the eyes appear in the trees yeah, yeah no, thank terrifying you. i wasn't surprised to read actually that the uk censors insisted that certain shots be removed i don't know which ones but i presume shots like that or else it was going to get a certificate that meant if you were under the age of 16 you needed to be accompanied by an adult so it did eventually come out in the uk <laughs> with a universal certificate but only after cuts were made to make it less scary and actually even the five-year-old who wasn't scared by the animated allusion was still a bit freaked out by the concept. Much is made of like how Disney prettifies everything. You know, it's not the Grimm Brothers classic. It's still pretty grim. Like, you know, he said to me, okay, Daddy, so why does the Huntsman have to kill Snow White? I mean, immediately that's a tough question to answer five minutes in. And it's like, well, the Queen has asked for evidence of her corpse by having her heart presented to her in a box that's why yeah. <laughs> it's quite well, full on. well thank god he had left the room by the time the box returns to the queen and she opens it up and looks at what is presumably a heart in a box <laughs> we don't actually see it but that's yeah. what's in there <laughs> 
But the thing that Disney had discovered in the course of making Snow White was the multiplane camera. And that came to be so significant in the development of all Disney feature films, all the way up to The Little Mermaid, which is basically to do with lighting. So essentially, instead of having one thing that you're filming, you have numerous different planes of glass that are being filmed from above from a camera, which means you can light the background dark and scary, but make Snow White look maiden-like and beautiful and pure, all in the same mm. shot. And that's the filmic sort of three-dimensional element that they managed to pull off with this that both contributes to the artistic achievement of it, but also, I think, is what blew Nugent's mind. I mean, in that review, uh, mm. he says, you will not most of the time realise you are watching animated cartoons. And if you do, it will only be with a sense of amazement. Uh, it seems hilarious today, doesn't it, when we're used to genuinely photorealistic 3D computer animated films, but the audience then didn't see it like we do, as sort of like Renaissance art, perfectly composed, but as yes. reality, like the closest thing they've ever seen to the depiction of a singing dwarf. And that critical acclaim was so important, particularly at a time when the US still looked to New York and New York critics for its overall cultural opinions, because this was a huge risk. It was, as we sort of touched on earlier, the first full-length animated film. And for the three and a half years it was in production, it was referred to as Disney's folly, mm. not just because mm. it was incredibly expensive. It ended up costing... $1.5 million, which was six times its estimated budget Oof. of 250000 One million of which had to be a loan from the Bank of America to complete it. Oh, there's a, there's a brilliant story about how Disney got that loan when he went to the Bank of America and ran a rough cut past the governor of the bank, Joseph Rosenberg, who sat completely impassively throughout the whole screening. And Disney was completely bricking it because he was like, I don't know if this is going to come off. I don't know what this is going to say. At the end, he turned to him and said, Walt, that thing is going to make a hat full of money and approved this loan that meant that he could go ahead and complete the film. Yeah, and the other concern aside from this ballooning budget was the fact that because a full-length animated film had never been done before, you know, people just weren't sure, will adults want to go and see this? Keeping in mind that at the time, there was no TV. So when you were seeing cartoons and short features, it was in the cinema before you saw the, the main film. So there was no precedent to be sure whether people would actually want to come and see 90 minutes of a cartoon. And so it's all the more impressive that Frank S. Nugent's review dwelt with particular warmth on the things that adults still enjoy in Disney and Pixar animated films. The clever background details, the little mm. amusing jokes. He picks up on the animals using their tails as dusters with the sequence where they're cleaning up the cottage. Yeah, my five-year-old picked up on that too. He was like, ugh, who would want to drink from a cup that a squirrel had wiped with its ass?" <laughs> I mean, the audiences have got a lot more sophisticated, it has to be said over the years. I mean, Nugent also said that the hand and lip movements assume an uncanny reality. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Chaplin, who went to the Hollywood premiere those couple of weeks earlier, said that it had even surpassed our high expectations. I love that he talks about himself in the third person, <laughs> our high expectations. But he said, in Dwarf Dopey, Disney has created one of the greatest comedians of all time. And I look back at that and I thought, Dopey's funny, but is he that funny? Maybe, I guess, in the era, in this sort of era that spans from like silent film to talkies, that sort of mm. physical humour was all the rage. Nugent really waxed lyrical about Dopey. Reading between the lines in his review, it was almost like he was expecting there to be Dopey-focused spin-offs yes. of Snow White, <laughs> which never really came about. But that did hit on something that did make the film particularly appealing, which was the characterisation of the dwarfs, because in the Brothers Grimm original, they're just seven nondescript dwarves. They don't have their own personality That's the traits. full title in the German. <laughs> Snow White and the seven nondescript dwarves. It's all one word it's in <laughs> German. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's an amazing German word. Um... However, in the process of coming up with the iconic dwarves, they did have to reject several proposed dwarves. Oh, no. uh, so here are some Was of the ones me? that didn't make the cut. <laughs> no, I mean, oh, some of them are not too far off, though. You've got Shorty, which obviously is the Italian gangster nice. dwarf. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got Deffy, which is just... Yeah, where are you going to go with that character? Probably only one yeah. place and over and over again. They also really wanted to get a fat dwarf in there mm. because they've got... Puffy, Stuffy and Tubby were all rejected. <laughs> well, to be fair, it's physical comedy, Rebecca. I mean, that's a whole avenue of humour, isn't it, that you don't want to shut down? It's interesting that they also got rid of Burpee. That was another of the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the considered dwarves. In favour of Sneezy, I guess, who's a, a bit less repulsive but offers the same kind of <laughs> humour. Um, but still, a very one-note dwarf. And you know, he only sneezes four times in the whole film. 
that is again something that my five-year-old picked up. He was ah. like, why is he called Sneezy when he never sneezes? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we can't complain that he's a one-note character <laughs> and then complain that he doesn't sneeze enough. There is a fanny joke in the final film, by the way. Oh, yeah. Doc says something about fannies. He has a spoonerism where he accidentally says fanny and something else. It's when he's talking about um, nook and crannies. Yes. And because his thing is that he keeps getting the words slightly wrong. Yeah. And he goes, hook and manny, crooked fanny. But yeah. he stops on fan. He says fan. He doesn't say e. So it's just sort of still like a universal rated joke. Naughty. <laughs> it means your buttocks in America, which is slightly less horrifying. It does. Yes. Still a fanny joke. <laughs> <laughs> next time the equivalent of you know going to see russell brand's play (laughs) about the noughties that was why people went love the show support the show patreon.com slash retrospectors part of the acast creator network